Welcome to the Deadly Addictions channel. Hi there, and thanks for joining me. I'm going to be doing another podcast on the sciences. I'm calling this one Animal That Doesn't Need Oxygen. Again, this will be an article that I read. The titles in the for these articles are long, so that's why I condensed them and fucking take up all the space. But this comes from Science Alert. Michelle Starr. And the actual title of the article is Scientists Find the First Ever Animal That Doesn't Need Oxygen to Survive. Right away, I'm excited. My mind's racing when I first saw this, which is why I, I highlight them. I read the article, give my thoughts here and there, and um, I'll begin now. Some truth about the universe and our experience in it seem immutable. The sky is up, gravity sucks, nothing can travel faster than light. Multicellular life needs oxygen to live. Except we might need to rethink that last one. Scientists have just discovered that a jellyfish-like parasite doesn't have a mitochondrial genome, the first multicellular organism known to have this absence. That means it doesn't breathe. In fact, it lives its life completely free of oxygen dependency. This discovery isn't just changing our understanding of how life can work here on Earth. It could, have, it could also have implications for the search for extraterrestrial life. Life started to develop the ability to metabolize oxygen, that is, respirate sometime over 1.45 billion years ago. A large archaeon engulfed a smaller bacterium, and somehow the bacterium's new home was beneficial to both parties, and the two stayed together. That symbiotic relationship resulted in the two organisms, organisms evolving together, and eventually those bacteria and cons within became organelles called mitochondria. Every cell in your body except red blood cells has large numbers of mitochondria. These are the essential for the respiration, or respiration process. They break down oxygen to produce a molecule called endosine triphosphate, tri triphosphate, which multicellular organisms use to power cellular processes. We know there are adaptions that allow some organisms to thrive in low oxygen, or hypoxic conditions. Some single-celled organisms have evolved mitochondria-related organelles for anaerobic metabolism. Or anaerobic metabolism. But the possibility of exclusively anaerobic, anaerobic multicellular organisms has been the subject of some scientific debate. That is, until a team of researchers led by Diana Yaholomi of Tel Aviv University in Israel decided to take a look at a common salmon parasite called, oh boy, Hanaguya salmonicola, salmonicola, salmonicola. Oh boy, it's going to be one of those podcasts. It's a Sindarian uh, belonging to the same phylum as corals, jellyfish, and animals. Wow. Jesus Christ. Although the cystic creates in the fish's flesh are unsightly, the parasites are not harmful and will live with the salmon for its entire life cycle. Tucked away inside its host, the tiny cinderine can survive quite hypoxic conditions. But exactly how does it how it does so is difficult to know without looking at the creature's DNA. So that's what the researchers did. They used deep sequencing and fluorescent microscopy to conduct a close study of H. Salmonicola, Salmonicola, and found that it's lost its mitochondrial genome. In addition, it's also lost the capacity for aerobic respiration and almost all the nuclear genes involved in transcribing and replicating mitochondria. Like the single-celled organisms, it had evolved mitochondria-related organelles, but these are unusual too. They have folds in the inner membrane not usually seen. 
the same sequencing and microscopic methods and closely related Sindarian fish parasite, Myoxbolus squamalis, was used as a control and clearly showed a mitochondrial genome. These results show that here, at least, it is a multicellular organism that doesn't need oxygen to survive. Exactly how it survives is still something of a mystery. It could be leaching endosine trisphorate from its host, but that, that's yet to be determined. But the loss is pretty consistent with an overall trend in these creatures, one of genetic simplification. Over many, many years, they have basically devolved from a free living jellyfish ancestor into the much more simple parasite we see today. They've lost most of the original jellyfish genome, but retaining, oddly, a complex structure resembling jellyfish stinging cells. They don't usually, or they don't use these to sting, but to cling to their host. An evolutionary adaption from the free living jellyfish's need to the parasites, you can see in the image above, the things that look like eyes. And then there's a picture associated with it. There's several links also. The discovery could help fisheries adapt to strategies for dealing with parasite with the parasite although it's harmless to humans no one wants to buy salmon riddled with tiny weird jellyfish it's also a heck of a discovery for helping us understand how life works our discovery confirms that adaption to a anaerobic environment is not unique to single-celled eukaryotes but has also evolved in a multicellular parasitic animal the researchers wrote in their paper Hence, H. Salmonicola provides an opportunity for understanding the evolutionary transition from an aerobic to an exclusive anaerobic metabolism. The research has been published in PNAS. There's a link. has a lot of links, a couple of pictures. Um, fascinated by evolution. Uh, this came to me right away when I saw it. Um, you know... Certain breakthroughs uh, are overshadowed by what people mostly care about every day and what we go through, blah, 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 the day and age we're living in. I don't have to mention again, the pandemic and all the shit that's going on. And this article is, uh, I think, from February 2020. We're going to be doing more tests like this. We are going to find uh, surprises that we didn't expect, or well, in a way, scientists do expect it in a way of that's how they hypothesize and go searching for answers. Uh, uh, according to this data, this should be what will happen. This should be predictable. And they look and to find a, a parasite, it doesn't need oxygen to live. That could make us re-examine how we look for life on other planets, as it says about extraterrestrial life. I get a kick out of science. I say this enough on all my science podcasts. Reading it gets me going, gives me a, a, this little thing of hope and you know, what we leave behind as a people, as a species, as a culture. And I'm hoping that science is at the forefront of uh, our journey through life. And hopefully we'll see uh, this anti-intellectual anti-science shit soon to fall away hopefully quicker than religion is fading away but it all comes and goes in cycles i think and you need these breakthroughs and these new understandings they'll build on each other and although i can't pronounce much of the words in these fucking articles i like reading them and putting them in the podcast and i wish it was a way I give more credit than saying Michelle Starr and the article, uh, the site that it comes from. I put all the, I'll put the link in the description for the article. But these are the things I'd love to delve into: how life evolved, how varied we are, what is out there. Just think of the things that live in your body, on your body, how we interact and touch things and. Again, the pandemic, the viruses and flus. It could be scary. It could be uh, interesting. Uh, it could be definitely informative. And I think we keep searching for answers. And that's the goal here, hopefully. Anyway, be well, everybody. And I'll talk to you soon.
Bye-bye.